Did you all have a good break? Did you all have a good break? Yes! Now when you say yes, do you mean everyone else did as well? Okay, anyway. Uh, well, midterm. Did the midterm, right? All right. Well, I don't know. I mean, we could spend some time going over it, but uh, I didn't think you would want to. I thought you wanted to move on. Okay, you say dead horse. Fair enough. You can't do anything about the midterm. But be aware that everything that you have studied is fair game for the final. Okay? In fact, if you look at previous finals, I'm sorry, I, I see you're pleased at that prospect. But the fact is, you know, this is math. Things tend to build on other things, particularly in the same discipline. As it turns out, we've done derivatives now. Uh, so what do we do in single variable calculus after we did derivatives? We did integrals. So and now we're going to do multi-dimensional integrals. Okay. Now, in single variable integrals, we thought of the integral, hopefully we thought at least some of the time, of the integral as a limiting sum. We're talking about adding up very, very many things. Infinitely many in some sense. But the things become infinitely small. Uh, that's very vague. So let me try to motivate what I want to say about double integrals first by a very simple problem. Okay, so those are 12 numbers. So, I don't know, how would you add them up? Well, you could just add them up. You could just add them in any order that you please and you would get the same total. So what is it? I don't know. Let's not be very systematic about it. 0 to 10, 11, 14, 12. Uh, I'm just going to go down here. 18, 21, back to 18, and 19, 24. So unless I made a silly computation mistake, I say the sum is 24. Okay, so you can see that it wouldn't really matter what order I did them in. As long as I didn't make a mistake, I get 24. But here are two more systematic ways of doing it. One is that I could add across 1 plus 3 is 4, minus 2 is 2, 5 uh, is 7. So I just put the total for each row here, 10, 16, 17, and 3 minus 3 is 0. And then I can just add those numbers up and get 24. I wrote 14. I did do a little double take, you'll be pleased. All right. Another possibility, of course, is I could go down this way. So I get 3, 11, uh, 4 plus 3 is 7, 6 plus 3. Okay. Now, if I've done this correctly, 3 plus 11 is 14, 21, 24. Isn't that some TV show? That's just a coincidence. Anyway. Uh, all right. So look. Basically, this is the idea with double integrals. We're going to define a pure double integral, which is a sort of nebulous thing in the sense that it's just somehow adding up all the function points in some order. And then we'll see how to compute them by being more practical and going in one direction and then the other, or perhaps in the other direction first and then this way. And then after we've done it for two dimensions, next week we'll do it for three, and there's not a lot of difference there. You just have to write an extra integral sign and a z. Anyway, it's a little bit more complicated, but not much. All right, so that's just by way of motivation. More generally, the simplest sort of case of a double integral is this. You have a function defined on an interval a, b cross an interval c, d. So that's actually a rectangle. And now I'm going to think of it of f of x, y, and the x goes between a and b, and the y goes between c and d. These are generally a bad variable to use because we write dx, but you, you'll be able to tell the difference between which d is d. All right, so the function is basically a set of values on here. Now, if there was some nice little patchwork, not necessarily regular, but of smaller rectangles, and the function was constant on each rectangle. So maybe here it's like 3, maybe here it's minus 4, it could be over here, 0.8, it could be pi. These don't have to be uh, integers. It could be negative, whatever. So basically then, what you would do to find, so first of all, try to visualize what the graph of such a function looks like. If we projected it down so that, let's let this be the x-axis, and let that be the y-axis, sort of like this. And then this is z, which is equal to f of x, y. So the rectangle in perspective would look something like this. 
and a value of 3 means that in this top corner here, the height is 3. So the function would actually be a suspended little rectangle, the same as this base, as if you had a little elevator, you know, freight elevator that just took you up there. Minus 4, of course, would be down here. And what we really want is the signed volume of this bizarre concoction of different heights. It's not a solid, it's not a connected surface, but it's a surface here, a surface there. Signed, of course, means that you want this volume to count as positive, but any volume below the xy plane you want to count as negative. Just like in areas under the x-axis was counted as negative. So basically to find the volume of this, you just add up the volume of the little blocks. And this is not so hard. You take the base area, whatever this is, times the height of the function. So in this case, what you would do is chop up the whole area into a whole uh, into these areas here, where it already kind of is, um, and you would add up the height of the function at a representative point. Well, let's call it delta a n. So the meaning of this sum, where I'm just assuming there are capital N of these little boxes, the meaning of this sum is, well, for each box, each box, so the nth box, whatever order I do it in, has area or base area, a little bit of a n, and the function, and, and x n, y n is somewhere in the box, is in the box. And because I'm assuming that the thing has constant height everywhere in the box, it doesn't matter which point you pick here. Any point in the base will give you the same height. And so this is just that the area of a rectangular prism is equal to the base area, I'm sorry, the volume of a rectangular prism is the base area times the height. So this is the height. And this is the base area, or a little bit of base area. So. If we want to actually integrate a more complicated function, which will, of course, find the volume of the, well, of the solid formed with bottom the xy plane, this, this rectangle here, and top being the surface z equals f of xy, with the convention that volume below is negative, as I said. If you want to find that, what you have to do is, for a more general function, is approximate it with one of these functions. This is called a simple function. Just like we took a partition in single variable, we chopped up the, the base into a little partition of intervals, and we approximated this function by some upper or lower or intermediate sum. Ah, you get the idea. We're going to do the same thing here, only it's much harder to draw. We have some surface that's suspended above a rectangle like this and we'll just sort of pick a rep we'll, we'll chop this up into a not necessarily regular grid as I say there could be different widths some of them closer together but in each base we'll choose a representative point we'll get a height and if we just flatten out the function so that we get these little block types of things and there's some much nicer pictures in the textbook You've got to imagine above every one of these little rectangles, there's just a flat top. We're just making a flat top of everything. And then we can form this sort of sum, and we can take a limit, and we can have a volume. Now, I would like to write that volume like this. I would like to write it like this. So this means that for every little bit of area, I'm going to pick a point x, y in that area and take that function height and let the areas go down to zero. So I want every little splodge of rectangle here to become smaller and smaller, and I'm going to take a limit. Now, I'm not going to write down the formal sum. This is not a course on Riemann integration, per se, and the technicalities of it. I just want you to understand that the partition method that we had has an analog. 
And that's exactly what we mean when we write this. And it's very reminiscent of this grid thing up here where I didn't care what order. You might say, oh, well, dA should be dx times dy, right? I mean, if here's x, and here's x plus dx, and here's a height of y, and there's y plus dy, then this area, the side length is dx, this side length is dy, so surely the area, dA, should equal dx times dy. It does, but the problem is that it also equals dy times dx, and there's an ambiguity, as we'll see, about the order that we write down the double integral. So what I want to do is just first have the concept of not having a particular order of adding this stuff up. That's it. Now, the textbook actually uses two integrals just to really drum it in that this is two variables. But it's sort of philosophically incorrect. Philosophically. Because there's only one thing here, dA, that we're adding up with respect to. Anyway, it doesn't really matter because you can't actually realistically compute anything using this formula or using this methodology. About something called Fabini's theorem, which it has a name. It's extremely nice. But from your point of view, you'd never be, well, it's unlikely you'd be asked to explain or state Fabini's theorem. Instead, it's like every double integral you do, you will be using Fabini's theorem whether you like it or not, okay? So it's just like, you know, it's just like breathing. That's what it's like. You just can't help it. Hopefully. Okay, so here's what it says. What it says is that to add up these numbers, you can do it by adding up the rows and then adding up those three numbers that you get. Or you can do it by adding up the columns and then summing those totals. So here's officially what it is. The double integral over R, where R is the region AB cross CD. So it's exactly this picture here. This is R. We'll have to scroll the camera over here for a second. But it's a direct so, so if you want to find the double integral of f of x dx dA, and I'm just writing the two integrals to be consistent with the textbook. As I said, I prefer one, but whatever. So it says that you can compute this in one of two ways, in either of two ways. So the first thing you can do is find the total along any row. Well, what do I mean by row? What I mean is that we'll just add up the values along here. That's an integral dx. dx. So you do one for each y. So the inner integral is f of x, y, dx from a to b. And then you do, you get a different value for each y. And then you add those up. So you integrate that. Okay, so this is called an iterated integral, bless you. Meaning that I'm going to do the first one, the inside one first, and then I'm going to do the outside one. Now let, let me be a little clearer about this. For every fixed y, if I just fix y, then f of xy becomes just a function of x. For, for a fixed particular y, if y is say 3, and you plug in 3, then there's no more y in there. It's just a function of x, which you can integrate. And what I'm saying is you've got to do that not just for 3, but for 2.9, for, for every value of y in between c and d. And that gives you a function of y. So this whole thing depends on which value of y you plugged in. This is a function of y. So you think of y being fixed, plugged in, and you get a number. That's a function of y. And that's the function that you're integrating. So you, a double integral here has become literally two integrals, one inside the other, nested, iterated. OK, so it's literally just finding that area of this cross-section, that area of this cross-section, that area of this cross-section, and so on, and then adding up or integrating all of the cross-sectional areas. That's another way of thinking. Now, that's one way of doing it. The other way is to go to the columns. 
So I will say or, so Fabini gives you for free, it's not, x is no more special than y, you can do the y integral first, holding x fixed, and then do the x integral of that resulting thing. So again, this is a function of x. What? Okay, so it's quite important, in fact, it's imperative that the AB matches the DX and the CD matches the DY. It would be a mistake to flip these around because, A, come in, come in. Uh, A, B are values on the X axis, not the Y axis. So you, you have to match these. Now, normally you don't write the brackets. Okay, so something like this. That means, you have to understand that that means that the same as this, which i.e. do this first. It's a little bit confusing because the integral you have to do first is the inside one. But it's not so confusing because actually integral with respect to what? The one you do first is the dy, because you found that first. And then you do this. So first, second. OK. So that's the idea. Did anyone actually bring an example that they'd like me to do? Is it, is it a rectangular region, or is it a more complicated region? OK, give me. OK, well, whatever. We, we, OK, if the, we've seen improper integrals before. Uh, you know, normally the way you handle them is you take one of the limits to be capital N, and then you take a limit as N goes to infinity. So in this case, the rectangle goes to infinity. This is a decent example. So this is actually from the homework that is due yeah. when? In a week from now. In a week from now. OK. So I will, yeah, homework is starting again. Is that what you're saying? OK. So you're supposed to find, it, it says it as integrate this over this region, but let me just write it like this. So it just says x should go from 2 to infinity, and y should go from 0 to 2. And the function is 1 over x squared minus x times y minus 1 to the 2 thirds, and x is going from, OK, so actually what you're given is the function, and you're told that it's an infinite rectangle with these dimensions. So I've already done actually a little part, I don't need this anymore, thanks. I've done a little part of the problem for you by converting that into this. Now you might say, oh, that was obvious. He just put 2 to infinity and 0 to 2, which I did. But I was just super careful to make sure that the dx matches the 2 to infinity and the dy matches the 0 to 2. Now, by this Fabini's theorem, actually, you could also write this or compute it as what is hopefully the same thing which is to switch the order of the integrals. Now, I should mention that Fabini's theorem doesn't actually automatically apply for infinite regions. Things get a little bit complicated. But we'll ignore those complications and save those for an advanced course on analysis. Instead, the beauty is that you get your pick of which integral you want to do. Only if it's rectangular, right? Only if it's rectangular. Even I have. Even if it's infinity. Okay? As far as we're concerned. As I say, there could be a complication. But in any case, in any case, suppose we do the y integral first. Now, this is not such a bad integral. This is not such a bad integral, if you look at it, because it's a product of two simpler functions. So if we take this and write this, you see, if x is constant, it can be pulled out of the integral. 
So you can actually just pull out the constant x squared minus x and, and do this integral first. Okay, you see that manipulation there? I just treated this as a constant. Constants just get pulled out of integrals. And that's an integral that you can just do. Does anyone have a guess as to what that integral is going to be in the middle? Anyone just sort of guess it? Even if log is y. It will be, it won't be log because it's y minus 1 to the power negative 2 thirds. But, yeah, but what will the definite integral be? You can say what it is. I think it's two thirds. You think it's two thirds? Maybe it's two thirds. I'm kind of, I kind of want to do it. <laughs> it's just this. This is the interior part here. So this is y minus one to the minus two thirds. I reckon that this is. So I'm going to say minus two thirds is the exponent. Add one, you get a third. And then you've got to divide by a third. You get 3 mi y minus 1 to the 1 third evaluated by between 0 and 2. OK, did I make a mistake here? I don't think so. If I differentiate, you get the 3's cancel out. You get y minus 1 to the minus 2 thirds. And if you plug this in, you get 3 times 1 to the third minus minus 1 to the third. Right? So it's 6. OK. So I guess what you're going to do is something still slightly bothering me, but I think I'm just hallucinating. I think I am hallucinating. OK, yes, I am hallucinating. Good. So that means that you've got to plug in 6. And I've reduced this to a one-dimensional integral here. OK, so I don't really intend to do this for you instead, because it is your homework. Instead, I'm going to ask, how do you deal with this integral? Can anyone say, in a nutshell, what the method of dealing with this integral is? Yes. Integration by parts. It might work, but I think partial fractions is better. I think partial fractions. But I mean, maybe integration by parts is very, is, it works here. But uh, to me, you can factor the bottom as x times x minus 1, and then you ought to be able coefficients are to make it be 6. I think that it will have to be 6 over x. Or you could pull the 6 out the front, actually. Uh, I think this is what it, I, how I would write the integrand. Does that work? Uh, maybe that's minus 6. How about that? OK, so if you multiply that through, you get negative 6x plus 6, and that cancels out the 6x here. So by replacing the integrand by this, which is like, I just did the partial fractions in my head, but it was a very simple one. Uh, you ought to be able to do that. And you, what you want to do is actually replace this by limit as n goes to infinity. So you do the integral up to n, and then take the limit. That's just a single integral here. Um, and then for yox, if you want to, you can do it the other way around, although the function is not really a beautiful, it's not a classic function of x and y. It's a, it's a too nice function of x and y in a way, because it splits up into two functions. The multiple of a function of x times n function of y. So it's f of x times g of y. You know, the more, the only reason the example is interesting in a way is because one of the limits is infinite. All right, so I've left you with a little bit of work to do, but at least that should be a start, right? Thank you very well. You're very welcome. All right. So let's leave that as an, as an example uh, of this simple case. Unfortunately, it's too simple in a way. You don't see too many exam questions where the region of integration, this R that I had written here, is such a nice thing as a rectangle. So suppose, for example, that I only wanted these numbers. OK, well, these totals are no longer correct. What I have to do is know that I had to start here. When I do this row, oh, 
I've got to somehow start at row entry number three. So minus two plus five is three, two, eight, six is 16, and zero. So it's 19, whereas if I do it this way, uh, I've got to know to skip one, start at entry number two, and also stop at entry number two. So here also two, eight, four, five, add them up and you get 19 again. Okay, so this means that if your region is not so nice as a rectangle, you have to sort of work out where to start and where to stop. So here's the basic idea. If you're trying to find the integral over some region R of f of x, y, dA, again, I'm following the textbook's convention, suppose the region looks like this. Okay, so this is some function, let's do g of x, y equals g of x, and this is y equals h of x, and this is the axis here, so let's say that's a and that's b, and it doesn't matter if either of these functions are below the x-axis, it, it doesn't matter at all. If the region R is described like this, so this is the base of the solid that we're finding the volume of. F is sort of sitting above here. So just like I made the rectangle in perspective, really the end integral as a volume, will be, you kind of need to tip the R over and then view the F as the height. So the base region is trapped between x equals a, x equals b, and these two squiggly curves, y equals g of x and y equals h of x. Well, the version of Fabini's that will work in here, in this case, is that it's particularly good uh, actually to do a y integral first, the way that I've drawn it. So you pick a particular value of x, and we're going to do the y integral. The y value is going to go between g of x and h of x, and it's going to be f of x, y, dy. Then we'll do the integral dx from a to b. So this is a more complicated system, but this is still a function of x. So now I'm asking you to think of x as being fixed before all you did was plug it in here, and you got an integral where the function inside just depends on y because you fixed the value of x, you put in x equals 3. Well, the only greater complication is you also have to plug in the value in here and you get a different set of limits of integration depending on what x is, which makes sense if you look at the, at the picture. Here, you want to go from this height to this height, g of x to h of x. But for a different x here, x1, you want to go only over this height, g of x1, h of x1. So. Again, this is a function of x, but it can be more complicated. You have to plug in integrands, which are not just numbers, but which are functions of x. Then you put in that function of x blah, into the integral. Now that's the version when the region looks like this. However, I better write down, although it's pretty obvious what I'm going to write down if you think about it, I better write down the other version. Which is when you do the x integral first. In that scenario, what you really want to do is think of the region as looking like this. So there's a particular y range that you're concerned about. And maybe I'll just draw it like this. Suppose the region looks like this. Now, if you tip your head on your side, this is still the y-axis and this is still the x-axis. Uh, I'll call this capital A to capital B this time. I could call it C to D, but what the hey. Um, I tip it on my side, and I can think of this as x is equal to, say, capital G of y, and this is x equals capital H of y. So I'm thinking of x as a function of y instead, uh, and of course, everything then reverses. You have a double integral with that as the region, the a. Then this says that you better do the x integral first. 
and x is going to go from capital G of y to capital H of y. So for any particular y, we're picking a value, the values of x are G of y, or capital G of y, and capital H of y. And those are the values of x we're going to integrate over. We do that for every y, and then we integrate. I'm feeling bad about calling it capital E now because I've used that too many times. I'll go back to C to D. It's just the top part and the bottom part of the whole figure. Sorry about that. Can't use two A's in the same formula. This wouldn't be right. Although now I've got two D's, right? Well, whatever. Not the same D. Okay, so in reality, you probably have a situation, a lot of the time anyway, where it's sort of ambiguous as to which of these two scenarios you're in. For example, if you have two curves that look like this, then I don't know which, which one is which. I mean, if this is A, B, C, D, okay, maybe this is your H of X, and this is your G of X. But you could take inverse functions, and for this one, you could write X equals H inverse of Y, which I actually called, ironically enough, G of Y. It's the bottom function when you tip your head on your side. Whereas here, x would be g inverse of y, which again, ironically, I would have called h of y. So the point being that you can flip from one paradigm to another, as in you can do the x integral first or the y integral first, but only if your region is nice enough such that the functions have inverses. In this case over here, it would be a horrendous mess to do the x integral first instead of the y integral. The reason being that, okay, look how nice it is to do the y integral first. Any x you chop down has just one interval, a, a bottom to a top. Whereas the way I've drawn it, or the way the region is, if you do the other order of integration, and you have your y coordinate fixed, and you draw a line, you've actually got to go from here to here, and then also from here to here. So for, you'd actually have to add up two integrals. That would be a mess. So what I'm trying to say is sometimes there's a really clear order in which you have to do the integration, and other times there's some ambiguity. And sometimes you can, the question might even ask you to reverse the order of the integration. So we've got to look at a few of these problems. And I guess you have one too, but I, I'd like to do a couple of examples first. So here's just an example that comes from the review session six uh, worksheet that I had online. It's actually from a quiz from fall 03. So it says, R is the region in the first quadrant. Bounded by x equals zero, y equals nine, and the parabola y equals x squared. And you are asked to set up the limits of integration for both orders of the double integral 4x cosine y squared d b. And the, and the second part says you uh, compute the integral, actually find the value of the integral using either of the forms. OK, so the way to solve this problem is to draw the region first. So we're in the first quadrant x equals 0 is the y-axis, y equals 9 is here, and y equals x. So here's the region we're integrating over. Well, there's no choice at this point. We're asked to do both double integrals. So we can choose which one we want to do first. Let's just do the one where we fix x first. So we're going to do the y integral first. So notice how I'm thinking. I'm going to just draw a vertical line. I'm thinking, ah, fixed x. x equals something. Uh, that means I'm going to do the y integral first. And the question is, where am I going to integrate from? So let's set this up first. The function, as in the integrand, doesn't change, which is a relief. 
But I'm saying we're going to do the y integral first, and then the d, then the x integral. And really what's critical is what we write here and here. So for any fixed x, the beginning height is what? How high is this point? x squared. So the bottom is x squared. And then how high do we go up to? 9. OK, so as a reality check, you cannot have x squared and dx there. That's no good. That's good. No, this is different from what you're integrating with respect to. OK, so you've got to know when to, to these things don't even look right, because you don't want to write down something that doesn't make any sense. That's always a bad idea in math. Forget wrong. Nonsensical is even perhaps worse than wrong. Anyway, um, now the question is, I'm going to chop this for different values of x, but where do I start and where do I finish? Well, I start at 0, but what's this point here? If no one told it to us, we have to, we have to use our intelligence and realize, yes, 3 squared is 9. So this is going to be from 0 to 3. And again, you should expect to see that the leftmost integral has no variables in it at all. It's a mistake if you have a variable in there. Unless, of course, you're expecting a f the overall integral to be a function of some other parameter, okay? which it, I guess could happen, but it's basically pretty rare. As, as long as you're doing a fairly standard integral without a subsidiary variable, as in it only has x's and y's, then it's got to be number, number, and then function of one variable, function of one variable with the other variable first. Okay, that's the format of these things. Okay, so that's one of the versions. Any questions about that and how I wrote that down, how I, how I came to see that? All right, now let's do the other one. The other direction, I'll set it up as still 4x cosine y squared dx dy. Okay, so that means I'm going to fix a y. And I've got to work out where the x-coordinates are. So what's the starting x-coordinate? How, how, it's 0. But what about the finishing x-coordinate in terms of y? So for this fixed y, what's this value of x? Square root. Be careful. If you're in the other quadrant, you might have negative. In the second quadrant, you'd have negative the square root. But as it is, it is indeed the square root of y and then where does y go from? It starts at 0 and goes up to 9. So that's the other order. So in this case, we just put the function that we got, the bottom to the top, but then we have to work out the 3. Here, the 0 to 9 was sort of easy because we were given the 9, but we just had to invert y equals x squared. All right? Any questions about that? It's all straightforward? All right. So now. That is the first part of the question. The second part says evaluate it. And it says only one of the integrals is doable. It even gives you that hint. So I'm going to ignore the hint and not even think about it and just try the first way, the first integral there. I could maybe save some time, but it's such a simple function again because it's just the product of two functions. That So the first one. I can pull out the 4x as a factor, and I can just do this. The first integral there, that's this one. So, so moving over there, I'm pulling out the 4x. Anyone know how to do the integral of cosine y squared? What's the antiderivative of that? If you really know, I'd be very interested to hear it. It's impossible. There's no, no simple primitive antiderivative for that. It cannot be done. It's unfortunate because it comes up all the time in optics, and you just essentially have to approximate it. But anyway, can't do it. No. Nope. <laughs> but luckily, we have another trick up our sleeves. I'm going to do the other integral. To do that, I'm going to pull out the cosine y squared, which is the other factor, and integrate from, where was it, 0 to root y of just 4x.
Ah, this, this at least we can start, we can do this middle integral. So the integral of 4x is 2x squared. And that's got to be evaluated between 0 and root y. So we still have to do a substitution of the values at least. If I plug in root y, I'm going to get 2y. And if I plug in 0, I get 0. And this is beautiful because 2y is exactly the derivative of y squared. So you'll find that you get sine of y squared evaluated between 0 and 9. Indeed, the derivative of sine y squared is 2y cosine y squared. And because sine 0 is 0, this is just sine of 81, whatever that is. Okay, question. Okay, so he wants to make a Taylor series of cosine y squared. Yeah, you could turn it into a Taylor series. Then you'd have to plug in x squared, and you would get another Taylor series in x squared. Then you would do the integral, and you would get some infinite sum, which would actually converge to sine 81. Now, would that be wrong? No. Technically, you should prove that it converges before you do these manipulations, but hey, they're all sines and cosines. And you'd actually end up with an interesting formula for sine 81 as an infinite series. It might just be this, the uh, Taylor series for sine 81. I don't know. Would it be wrong? You're writing down the right answer, but it's pretty hard to compute. So that, again, is a philosophical question. When I read the problem and it says, compute the value of the integral, only the of two forms is doable. It makes me think that you're better off writing that than some infinite series <laughs> which converges to that. So yeah, I mean, you would probably get credit anyway just for being creative, but let's be simple. Then creative. All right, a question up the back? No, okay. No, it's good, it's good. I mean, actually, there are pages of formulas that of, of infinite series that converge to pi and pi over four, and some of these are extremely beautiful and some of them are extremely useful. So, and they were found by people just mucking around with double integrals and Fourier series and whatever, exactly like you want to do. And so I approve of it. I just also believe that you should be practical in a quiz. <laughs> okay. So um, I'm going to advise against it, but with a sadness in my heart because I want you to explore things as well. So try it. Try it. Try it not during a quiz. That's, that's what I would say. And then you, you can email me what the series is. See if it's just the Taylor series evaluated at 81. That would be interesting. Or the McLaren series. All right. Let's do another one. This is from a midterm, fall 2002. Double integral, e to the x minus y dA. And the region. R is a triangle with vertices 0, 0, 1, 3, 2, 2. So we're not asked to give both orders. We're not even told which order to do. We have some flexibility. But we should draw the damn triangle. So here it is. 0, 0, that's easy. 1, comma 3 is up here, and 2, comma 2 is over here. OK, so my natural inclination when I do a double integral without being told anything and without seeing any preference for x or y in the integrand is to fix x and do the y integration first. Because that means that you're writing y equals f of x. And I always think of y equals f of x as easier than x equals f of y. So the problem is that the bottom is nice. That's the bottom of each of these lines, these intervals here. Uh, in fact, that is just y equals x because it passes through 0, 0 and 2, 2. So it has slope 1. However, the top is a little bit messy. It's one thing, and then it's another. So it's going to be piecewise. So my best bet is actually to chop up the region into two regions. 
that one, and that one. And that's okay. There are some theorems on double integrals, all of which are entirely obvious, but deserve to be written down in the tech, they're in the textbook in this section, 15.1. And they tell you that, yes, if you have two regions that don't overlap, and you want the integral of the union over the union of them, then you can chop up the region into the two and add up the two integrals. And it's exactly what you would expect. So what is this function? Well, it's a line through the origin of slope 3. So this is y equals 3x. This one, it goes through 2, 2, and 1, 3. would be y is 4 minus x. So you actually have to go to the trouble, I believe, of finding these uh, lines here that form the sides of the triangle. So we're doing two integrals. I'm going to already sneakily, it's not so sneaky, <laughs> write e to the x minus y as e to the x times e to the minus y. Uh, we're going to do the y integrals first in both cases. And there's going to be two of these damn things, because I've split the region into two. In the first region, for a fixed x between 0 and 1, we're going from x up to 3x. And x itself is going from 0 to 1. For the second region, y still has as its bottom x. But this time it's going up to 4 minus x. And this time x is going between 1 and 2. Now in each case I'm doing a y integral. So I can pull out the e to the x. I'll just write out the gory details. Even though they're very, very similar to each other. Do the sec same trick on the second integral. Okay, so the integral of e to the minus y is minus e to the minus y. So e to the x times minus e, so this is a times here, minus e to the minus y evaluated between x and 3x the x, repeat, soak, rinse, minus e to the minus y evaluated between x and 4x, no, 4 minus x, can't read my own writing, the x. Okay, so let's plug in here. Business. We get minus e to the minus 3x, Minus, minus will give us plus e to the minus x. Huh. There's a shiny spot on the board. That's fun. The, the chalk just glides over it. If the whole board was like that, you wouldn't be able to read anything, but my hand wouldn't get tired. Okay. You don't care. <laughs> Not very much. Just a little bit. Minus e, now when we plug in this, we get negative 4 minus x plus e to the negative x dx. Okay, so one term is minus e to the minus 2x plus 1. And the other term is going to be minus e to the x plus x, that's 2x minus 4 plus 1. Anyone want me to actually do these integrals? They're one-dimensional integrals. If I see a single hand, I'll just finish it off. Okay. Yes? Okay, fine. I am happy. Um, when you integrate e to the minus 2x, you divide by minus 2. So I'm, I need a minus a half, but there's already a minus, so this will be one half e to the minus 2x. Reality check, differentiate this, and you get minus 2 out the front. 
which cancels the half, but leaves you with the minus that you want. Plus integral of 1 is x. That's all evaluated between 0 and 1. In this case, it's 2x minus 4. The sneakiest way to deal with that actually is to write it as e to the minus 4 times e to the 2x. But in any case, the effect is going to be the same. You are just simply going to divide by 2 the coefficient of this. So it's minus 1 half e to the 2x minus 4. And again, not a bad reality check. The derivative of this is 2, cancels. And that's evaluated between 1 and 2. OK, do you, do you want me to keep going? OK. It just saves a few seconds. It, you know, you have to obviously know your regular integration and all of its partial fractions and ramifications. So it might not be worth reviewing Math 104 notes about integration. Sorry, but that's what I recommend. Um, or if you have a copy of my book, The Calculus Lifesaver, available on Amazon.com. Um, <laughs> It only deals with single, single variables, so I'm not really recommending it. But it does have a nice review of integration, perhaps. Some, some, of, some people have told me this anyway. Um, OK. So, <laughs> not that I'm saying. Any other questions about that exam? All right. Um, do you want to ask your, is it just a double integral question over? You, you told me that you need the PB number and you can switch the dx dy. Yes. It's a rectangle. Yes. What if it's zero to infinity x and zero to infinity y? Can you also switch? Yes. It? Zero to infinity both ways is an infinite rectangle. Yeah. Yep. So it might but the fun if it doesn't converge, then you might be different in each way. Maybe that's what it's trying to. It, it might depend on which order you do it. So, okay, regular Fabini over a rectangle. It doesn't matter which order you do it. For some really funky functions especially ones that are oscillating between positive and negative values a lot, it actually can matter if it's an infinite region of integration in both ways. Then it actually can matter which order you do it in. And Fabini's theorem can break down. So that might be what the question is. Anyway, I, I, I can show it to you afterwards. Um, we can go over it. I need to move on unless there are any other questions about double integrals purely. OK. So that's 15.1. 15.2 deals with four or five, I'll call it four, formulas that involve double integrals. Okay, so now that we know what they are, there's no new sort of theory other than, okay, these are meaningful double integrals and they have certain names like average or moment of this or whatever. So let me just go over them and we'll see a few examples along the way. So these are, I like to think of this as practical applications of double integrals. And there are, there are four that you need to know. The first one's pretty straightforward. Areas. So if you just have some region, so if you form this, so if you just integrate the function 1, what does that give you? Here's some region, R. The height of the function is 1. So it gives you the volume of the prism of base R, this region, and height 1. Well, R, area of R times 1 should be the volume, because that's the perpendicular height. So it's actually just the area of R. So to find the area of a region, you just integrate 1. And sometimes you just write it as dA. The 1 is sort of implicit. It's 1 times dA. You just don't have to write it. OK, so this is sort of an obvious thing if you think about it, especially in the Fabini case. For example, if you're in this g, y equals g of x. Ah, y equals g of x y equals h of x, if this is what your region actually looks like, then according to Fabini's theorem, this, air, this integral 1 dA over that region should be, well, let's fix x and we'll do the y integral first from g of x to h of x 
of 1 dy and then the dx integral from a to b. Well, the integral of 1 is just y, and we're evaluating it at h of x and g of x. So this is the integral from a to b of h of x minus g of x dx. So actually, this is what we learned in Math 104, or the equivalent. To find the area of a region, you just sort of integrate the top curve minus the bottom curve. It makes a lot of sense. It's the, in it's the integral under h, which is all of this, minus the integral under g. That gives you the part that you want. So all we're doing is rewriting something that we already knew how to do into something that we've just learned how to do making things more complicated, perhaps. But there you go. Anyway, the reason that this is important, actually, is not so much in the computation of the areas, which, as I said, we kind of already know how to do, but rather in part b, which is average values of functions. And I'll explain what I mean in a few seconds. OK, so how do you find the average of a whole bunch of numbers? You add them up, and then you divide by the number of numbers. Okay, that's you've known that for many, many years, I presume. How do you find the average value of a function of one variable? What's the average value of this function? Well, some of it's up here, that, and some of it's down there. How much of it is down here? What you'd really like to do is add up the lengths of all these lines and then divide by the number of lengths. Unfortunately, if you do it properly, there are infinitely many lines. So guess what? Again, it makes sense as an integral. And we saw that the average value of f on the interval a, b is equal to 1 over b minus a times the integral of f of x dx. Nothing very interesting about this formula in a way, except what is the b minus a? Where did that come from? It's sort of the number of numbers, but it's not really because there's infinitely many. Still, you do have to account for having a longer interval rather than maybe just the shorter interval. So what it really is is actually the length of the interval. b minus a. So that you, you're taking the total sum of f over the interval divided by the, the length of the interval, and that's called the average value. So in two dimensions, if you have a function on some region r, however it looks, what you want to do is add up all the heights of the function, whatever the surface looks like. You want to add up all these heights and then divide by the area. Of R. So here it is, the, the average of f of xy, two variables, over R, a region R, is equal to 1 over the area of R times the double integral of f of xy. And this you need to just memorize. I mean, I, don't, I hope it's not a difficult exercise of memory if you already understood the one variable version. But nevertheless, you, you do have to learn it. Now, the point is that you already have to set up a double integral to do this. To do this, I mean, it is a double integral. When I say set it up, I mean you have to choose which one you're integrating with respect to first, and then draw the line and do what we've been doing. Once you've done that work, it's quite easy to do this by doing exactly the same integral but with a 1 there. So what I'm trying to say is that we can also write this formula in the practical way, as follows, i.e. the average of f over r is the double integral of f of xy dA over the double integral of 1 dA. That's another way of writing it. It's less intuitive than the first way, but quite a bit more practical. And so I'm saying once you've set this up, this one's easy. You just copy this one. You've done all the work to get the limits of integration. You just copy it down here, but you change the f of x, y just to 1. 
and then you can do both integrals. So there's two integrals involved in average values. Okay, I'm going to do an example. So it happens to be an infinite example. Okay, but it's from a quiz in fall 2003, and we'll see the infinity doesn't really hold any terrors for us. Uh, it says find the average of f of x y equals x cubed over 1 plus x squared over the infinite region R, and it's described as follows. R is between the x-axis, x greater than or equal to 1, and y equals 1 over x cubed. So here's what it looks like. The x-axis is down there. y equals 1 over x cubed looks like this, something like that. x greater than or equal to 1 is all we care about. So here's the infinite region R. And we are asked to find the average value of this function, ostensibly of two variables, but as you see, it only actually involves one of the two. Never mind. So according to this, the average, well, okay, we'll find the average of this function, f of xy equals this. Okay, so the average equals 1 over the area of R, times the double integral of f of x, y, I'm just writing this out again, dA over R. So let's get practical. Uh, which one are we going to fix? Well, again, it doesn't really matter. Um, I know y in terms of x, so my gut feeling is always to try the vertical lines first, meaning do the y integral first. Okay, so let's just do the numerator first. The y integral, y goes from 0 up to 1 over x cubed. And then this is dy. And my well, this is dy integral. x cubed over 1 plus x squared. And then the dx integral goes from 1 up to infinity. Again, the pattern is correct. Have a function of x, dy, and just two constants. Question. The question is, yeah, do, and I, I repeat the question, by the way, for the point of view of the video. Um, the question is, why not write n there and put a limit? And you could. I, I'm happy to leave it as infinity until I actually need to compute it, so I don't have to write limit n goes to infinity every time. I mean, they mean the same thing. This infinity here is the same as putting a capital N and writing limit capital N goes to infinity. If you had two different infinities, you kind of have to do an n, n, and m, and Make sure you put the interior limit in there and then the other limit there and it becomes complicated. So that's why Fabini's theorem sort of breaks down because the limits don't always switch with the integrals properly. But uh, he, if you only have one infinity, things turn out okay, basically. It's only the two that's the problem. Uh, nevertheless, for the bottom one, you see, I don't have to do any other work. I just copy the integral down, but I ignore the stuff in between the inner integral and the dy. Just put a 1 if you like, or just leave it blank. It's the same thing. All right, so let's do it. The top integral, this is a constant with respect to y. So it just comes through the integral sign, and you just get the integral from 0 to 1 third of 1. Well, you could write that as y and evaluate it, or you can just see what it is. It's just this minus this. So we'll have x cubed over 1 plus x squared as the constant popping out, times 1 over x cubed minus 0. I'm saving a step here, but hopefully it's fairly clear. In the bottom case, exactly the same thing. The integral of 1 dy is 1 over x cubed minus 0, or just 1 over x cubed. So we have two integrals we have to do. Luckily, 0 is very simple to deal with, and the x cubes cancel out. So um, maybe I'll move over here for a little more room. Uh, the top integral is 1 over 1 plus x squared. And the bottom integral is just 1 over x cubed. So we have to do these two improper integrals. Uh, when you did improper integrals, if you took math 104 or presumably in the equivalent, a lot of the times the question was, does the integral converge to or diverge? Here, here we, we, we need to actually find the values of them. So we do need these limits. 
but they're very straightforward. So now I propose to put these in. These are easy integrals to actually just do. So the top is like that. The bottom, uh, maybe I'll use a capital M, although there's no real ambiguity here. So the top is going to be limit as n goes to infinity of inverse 10. That's the, in that's the integral here between 1 and n over, well, this is x to the minus 3. If you add 1 to minus 3, you get minus 2. You have to divide by it. So it's minus a half x to the minus 2 between 1 and n. So we have to do a little more work. The top inverse 10 n minus inverse 10 1. As for the bottom, uh, it will be minus a half, and I'll put it as m squared on the denominator plus, and when you plug in 1, you get a half. OK, now we have to take some limits. Sorry, it's looking a little bit arcane down here. This is a squared. OK, what's the limit of inverse tan n? Can anyone tell me what the, the fate, the ultimate fate at infinity of inverse tan is? Pi over 2, a resounding chorus, not. OK, you have to learn these things. Right? The graph of inverse tan looks like this. It's just like a bit of tan on its side. It's not by any means flat here. It has slope 1, and it has these asymptotes there. So actually, what's the limit at minus infinity? Negative pi over 2. Okay, these are basic things that you have to resurrect into your memory. You have to remember these things again. So this is pi over 2. What's about, what about inverse tan of 1? What number has a tan equal to 1? Pi over 4, that was better. OK, on the denominator here, as m, this is an m here, goes to infinity, the power of m in the bottom is squared. So it's, this is a very large number on the bottom. That goes to 0. So you just get a half. So this is pi over 4 divided by a half, which is pi over 2. So that's the average value. All right, so it's two double integrals instead of one, but just different integrands, same setup. OK, any questions about that? Yeah, so obviously that example was a little tricky because it involved infinity there. But if it didn't involve infinity, the idea would be the same. All right, now we move on to all this moment business. OK, so there's a lot about moments in the textbook. I have to say. exhaustive. I didn't look at every single document on the website, but I looked at most of them. And I have been hard pressed to find a single question about moments of inertia. Okay, moments of inertia. Okay, it is in the textbook, and I will write down the formulas. But what I I, I have seen some questions about center of mass. So I've got to tell you about first moments, and then I'm going to really quickly tell you about second moments and moments of inertia. Okay, so these are just. This is, again, in 15.2. I've done areas and average values. Now I have to do first moments and centers of mass. So this is actually a, a thing from, this is a, actually a part from physics. So you have some region. And you can think of this as a solid plate, a solid plate. And what I want to assume is that the plate has a certain density, which is written delta of xy, delta, Greek letter for d, sort of, 
density. Okay, so basically what this is measuring is how locally heavy it is per unit mass, per unit mass. So if the whole thing has a density of five, then its weight, its mass rather, is five times whatever its area is. Okay, so it weighs five pounds per square inch, or it weighs five kilograms or grams, five grams per square meter or something, depending on what units you're working in. So that's what the density means, but I'm going to allow it to be heavier over here than over here or something like that. Now, what I'm interested in is where is it going to balance? If this is a, if this is a little, okay, first of all, we have to imagine that this is up. So meaning that I'm taking this little plate and I'm taking this axis and I'm trying to balance it so that it doesn't tip either way. So where is it actually going to balance? Well, if it's uniform density, <laughs> there's much more area on this side. So it's going to just go tilt, tip into the board. Okay, so that perspective diagram is like this. This is going to fall down. But not if this is heavier, say. If that's heavier, much heavier, it might actually balance on that. So if it doesn't have a uniform density, it might balance. So what I like to define is the moment about this axis here. So every solid has a moment about an axis, and that basically is going to tell you essentially how balanced it is or how out of balance it is. And if it's out of balance, which way is it out of balance? That's, that's, the, that's the physical interpretation of this thing, okay? So it's the moment. Well, first of all, I've got to tell you what the mass of the whole plate is. I mentioned that if the mass was, if the density was constant, say 5, then the mass is actually the area of the thing times the density. That's the definition of density for uniform density. But if the density is not uniform, then you kind of have to chop up the mass into many little pieces, each of approximately the same density, find out all the little bits of masses and add them up. Guess what? That's an integral. So it's the double integral of the density. If the density is 1, the mass is the area. We've already seen the formula for the, for the area. If the density is constant, then the mass is whatever that constant is times the area of the whole thing. OK, now what I've been looking at is the moment of inertia, of, of, sorry, the first moment about the y-axis, right? The y-axis is our axis. So I'm going to write my, so this is the mass. And then first moment about y-axis is actually the integral, confusingly enough, of x times the density. <laughs> Why isn't it y? Well, if you want to know what influence that has on the balance, that little bit of mass, you really care about this distance here. That distance is x, not y. So you have to take a, a, you assign a, of, a weight of x, if you like. It counts more than this mass in terms of imbalance because of the way torque works. Torque. Torque. I can't say that word. There's no R, right? Torque? Torque. How do you say it? Torque. Is anyone called Mark? No. Here? Mark. 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 OK, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> 10 years and I still can't put an R and a K sound together. Bizarre. Okay. So what I'm trying to say is stuff that is more to the right uh, counts more somehow. Even if it's the same mass, it, it, it has more torque. So it counts more to it. Stuff on this side has to be counted negative so that it, it cancels out stuff on the right side and, and gives you the left bias. So actually you don't just want the distance, which would be the absolute value of X. You want the sine thing. Of course, the first moment about the y-axis uh, the x-axis, thank you, mx has a y in it, and it's exactly the same thing, of course, but how balanced it is around this axis. Now, of course, in this case, the thing's not even balanced on the thing. Of course, it's going to go thudding down that way. But uh, there, is a, there is a geometrical interpretation to it. 
uh, as well. So it, the, the axis doesn't sort of have to pass through the region for this to make sense. Now, suppose that it does in fact pass through both of them. And both of these happen to be zero. Suppose they both happen to be zero. From what I've said, that would mean that this is the perfect balance point around the y-axis. Well, not the balance point. This is the perfect axis. Anything to the left, and the thing will tip that way. Anything to the right, it will tip that way. But this would also then be the perfect balance axis in this direction. So the implication is that this point is the perfect balance point. And if you took a little sharp pencil and balanced the thing, it would balance on that point. Because it, it's balanced this way, and it's balanced this way. So that's called the center of mass, and it would be the origin. It would be the origin if both of these are zero. Question. It's not the center of mass. mass. It is basically it tells you how much the region wants to rotate in the positive direction around the axis. So it's different for each axis that you choose. You can also define it for any axis. It doesn't, the, the book gives a formula. I don't even want to confuse things by, by writing down the formula. But basically, any axis has a, a moment with respect to it. And if it's positive, it means it wants to tip in the positive direction. If it's negative, it wants to pick, tip in the negative direction. The more positive it is, the more, the more it wants to tilt. So it's related to the torque of the, of the system. Okay? So if it happens to be zero, then it's perfectly balanced, and it, it doesn't want to tip either way. I mean, obviously, it, it will if you blow on one side, or, but it, it could be perfectly balanced. So every plane region has this. And it, remember, the density might be, it might be heavier here than over here. So this could actually be the perfect balance point. Okay, so the center of mass is found by taking any two perpendicular axes where you find the two axes where both the integrals are, are zero. And then the, the intersection point is the center of mass. And I'm trying to say that if these numbers are zero, then the center of mass, mass will be the origin. But if they're not zero, then you could make them zero by shifting them over the right amount. Or in other words, it's not hard to manipulate these formulas and show the following. The center of mass, in general, doesn't have to be at the origin. So it's the y moment divided by the mass is the x coordinate, and the x moment divided by the mass is the y coordinate. And it's horribly confusing when it's written like this. But the beauty of it is that actually, if you look at the formulas, and maybe this is an even more intuitive way to remember it, because at least they match up. It's 1 over m times the x times the density. That's the x coordinate. And the y coordinate So when I've written it that way, now the, the x coordinate has an x in the formula and the y coordinate has a y in the formula as opposed to vice versa. Is it meant to be an R or a delta? Uh, here? Oh, thank you, yes. It is meant to be an R. This is meant to be a delta. Okay, so again, in each case, you now actually have three integrals to worry about because the m is a hidden integral. Which appears twice. <laughs> yes, you have three integrals, but they all have the same bounds. They're just three different functions. So this is not so bad as it seems. You, you don't have to set up the three integrals. Just tells you how likely it is to tip, tip in the positive direction about the axis, about that axis. Okay. How much it wants to tip. Yeah, in the positive range. So if it's negative, it means it doesn't want to tip at all downwards. It wants to tip up, as in the other side wants to tip down. And the more negative it is, the stronger that, that, that attraction will feel. All right? OK, so I've never seen a question on moments other than find the center of mass of a system. OK, now, for, 
that doesn't mean you couldn't get one. But of course, finding the center of mass involves finding the moments anyway. Okay, so. Is, and for some bizarre reason, the textbook waits until after it does moments of inertia to say this, when it has nothing to do with moments of inertia. Um, it talks about centroids of a region, and it's a special case, so I'll just cram it over here. Centroid of a region. So the idea here is that we have a region that you don't even necessarily think of as being a plate. It's just a geometrical region like this. And you want to find the center of the region. Now, if it was a perfect circle, the center would be in the middle. <laughs> but if it's not a perfect circle, what the hell do we mean by center? Well, nothing. That's why we call it centroid. So what it means, again, <laughs> is you have to imagine taking a plate of uniform density, which may as well be one, so you take, it, it's not heavier in any bits, it's just like a, a nice bit of metal that's uniform, and you want to find the center of mass of it. So this is just the same as the center of mass. So a centeroid of a region R is the same as the center of mass of a solid or a plate with density Okay, density one in the shape of R. Does it have to be density one or just constant density? Well, okay, suppose you took density three. So what I'm trying to say is in this formula, I'm encouraging you to replace delta by one. But if you like to re replace it by three, you will have a factor of three on the top and you'll also have a factor of three on the bottom and they will cancel. So it doesn't have to be one, it just has to be constant but there is no sense in taking it to be anything other than one because it will cancel anyway. So basically what I'm trying to say is, i.e. same formula, but you just ignore the delta. Or rather set it to be one. So it's a, it's a geometrical fact that has some relation to a physical fact. Now unfortunately, the, the reason why you might not get a physical uh, is that if you actually have a region that looks like, say, this, an annulus, it's supposed to be an annulus, then the centroid's in the middle. It won't balance very well if you try it. The thing will just go, but if you could imagine that you could balance it, namely, I don't know, take a tiny extra little bit of metal that doesn't weigh anything and fill it in like this, then it would be the balance point. Okay, so it has a geometrical meaning even if it doesn't have a physical meaning because the region doesn't contain its centroid. That's, the, that's what I'm trying to say. A region need not even contain its centroid. In fact, it, even, it doesn't even have to have a hole in it. If it looked like a, a horseshoe, maybe the center of mass could be in the middle. This can be important if you're like an athlete who throws horseshoes. Is there any athlete who throws horseshoes here? Yeah. I don't know. Don't people do it? I mean, hell, I, people chop logs on ESPN. <laughs> throw horseshoes. I guess, I mean, you know, there's a horseshoe throwing championship somewhere. People toss cases and stuff. What's the center of mass of a haggis? Anyone here actually eaten a haggis? You've eaten a haggis? And you're still alive. It was terrible? What was its center of mass? Before or after you ate it is the question. Okay. Um, yeah, but it was bad though. Are you asking what a haggis is? You don't want to know. Look it up on Wikipedia. All right. Um, uh, center of mass. Man, I was going to write down a problem from an old final. Did I actually do it? No? I forgot. Anyone have a center of mass problem they'd like me to do? You know what? I'd better skip it. I'd better skip it. And the reason i better skip it is because I've got a lot more to do in half an hour. So what I'm trying to say is that to do it, you just have to do three double integrals, right? You will know what the region is. 
you will know what the density is because they will tell it to you. And you just need to know that you have to do the integral that's obvious with the density to find the mass. And then you have to throw an extra x in there and then repeat. And then throw an extra y in there and repeat. And you get three integrals and you assemble them into that formula. I'm really copying out by not giving an example, but uh, <laughs> sorry. OK. Well, look, you know, we'll have time to do examples later. I, I'd better tell you in a nutshell about moments of inertia, although I really don't want to get bogged down again. Moments of inertia. This is kind of useful if you're a ballet dancer or an ice skating dancer. Anyone done any ice dancing? Oh, well, you've seen it, damn it. You know how they go like this, and then they go woo, woo, really fast, and they don't even seem to be pushing off or anything? That's because of moments of inertia. Basically, the textbook has a pretty nice explanation of it. If you just take a pencil, and you, you balance it on your finger. If you put two coins on the end uh, and see how sort of stable it is, if you move them in the middle, you'll find that it's a lot easier to rotate in a way. So basically, if you're trying to lift something, it matters how heavy it is. But if you're trying to rotate something about an axis, then instead of the mass, what's important is the moment of inertia. So it's a proxy for a mass. It's the same thing as a mass, but it's about an axis. So if this is an axis and I have some region, like in the other case, forget about whether it's going to balance or not. Just think about how easy it is to turn the thing. Now, there, all that matters is how the mass is distributed. So for the same mass, the closer it is, the easier it is. So that's why they curl themselves in around this axis. They have a lower moment of inertia than when they're like this, because some of their mass is further away. So basically then, the motivation, that's the motivation for the formula that the inertia around the x-axis is I of x, and I guess I should have written the y one first, but whatever. y squared times the density. And similarly, OK, there are a couple of other formulas and radius of gyration and all that sort of business that you can read in the textbook if you want to. But again, it it's, doesn't seem like questions are really asked about it. I, I don't even think there's any homework questions about it. So let's, let's, let me just say that this is called the second moment as well as the moment of inertia because instead of the power x, here you have x squared. That's, that's it. So there are third moments and higher. And they're also important in statistics. You might have seen moments, skewness, kurtosis, and all this sort of stuff. So it doesn't just come up in physics. But basically, the, the main difference, as far as I'm concerned, is the square here means that mass on either side counts as positive, unlike in the first moment case where it counted as negative if it's the left. It tells you a direction. Here it just tells you how heavy the thing is with respect to rotation about that axis. From a practical point of view, it's just another double integral, but you have to understand inertia. Oh, I better put in the second power and make sure that you switch the variable. Why? Oh, man. It's, it's, look, you know, it's to do with kinetic energy. You want to move something to it from rest to a certain speed, the kinetic energy has to be a half the mass times v squared, right, where v is the velocity. So, it turns out to move something to a certain angular speed, the energy is a half times the mass times the velocity squared. But the velocity is now the angular velocity, and the mass is now the moment of inertia. Aren't you glad you asked? Yeah. So basically, it comes, from, it comes from physics. It comes from the analysis of what happens when you try to do motion in a circle as opposed to motion along a line. And masses change into inertias. and Velocities change into angular velocities, number of revolutions per second, that sort of stuff. And, you know, it's a big topic. I don't have time to do it. It's, it's a nice part of physics. And I, I wish, you know, I, I didn't have to give it a short shrift, but I do. All right. As far as we're concerned in this course, if you do ask, if you do get asked inertia, you just have to know to do this formula. It's not very satisfactory. But 
There's, more, there's a slightly, I mean, read the textbook. It's like two pages, and most of it I've already just told you. So it's, it's not that hard. It's, it's kind of, it's, there's some pretty pictures and stuff like that. Okay. <laughs> right. So we have 25 minutes to go. So I want to move on to section 15.3, which is polar coordinates. Okay, just to clarify, have you all done this in class yet, or are you sort of... No. 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 Okay. You've done 15. Oh, you haven't even done 15.2? No. Oh, wow. So the review no. session, I'm ahead. I presume you don't mind too much. Yeah. Okay. No. Well, you know, I'm sure I'll fall behind us since I sort of am quite verbose. Anyway, <laughs> let me tell you about polar coordinates in the next 25 minutes anyway. Um, all right. So we've chopped up this region into little rectangles, x, y rectangles. But you can also chop things up. Sometimes functions are kind of defined on regions that look might think some like more like this. And the functions might be particularly nice in polar coordinates. So to remind you what these are, instead of describing the point x, y by telling your friend to walk, say, five units along the x-axis and then three units up the y-axis, which incidentally they could do in the other order if they felt contrary and you still end up at the same place. You can tell your friend to start at the origin, face east along the positive x-axis, turn a certain angle theta, and march a certain distance r. And if you are perverse enough to give a negative r, then they should walk backwards. But we'll try to avoid negative r's here. Okay, so here is the angle theta. And this length is r. So in polar coordinates, the coordinate r theta corresponds to x equals r cosine theta and y equals r sine theta. So you absolutely have to know that. That tells you how to convert from polar into Cartesian. Because if you know r and theta, you just plug them in. Uh, now, of course, the reverse is a little trickier. You'll have r squared is x squared plus y squared. That's the Pythagoras theorem. And theta, the best formula is tan theta is y over x. If you just divide y divided by x, the r's cancel, and you get sine over cosine, which is tan. Um, this doesn't tell you what theta is. There's an ambiguity. For example, if y and x are both equal to 3, tan theta is 1. But if y and x are both equal to minus 3, tan theta is also 1. But 1 is in the first quadrant, and the other one's in the third quadrant. So there's an ambiguity of pi with this formula. Also, x cannot be 0. Otherwise, this doesn't even make sense. But if x equals 0, then you're on the y-axis, and tan theta is infinite, which means theta is pi over 2 or 3 pi over 2. So this is all basic trig. You've done polar coordinates in single variable. I, I don't want to spend any more time on that little aspect. Instead, I want to show you how to use polar coordinates to find double integrals, since that's what we're doing, double integrals. So without much further ado, let me show you what's required here. We're taking a region similar to the one I drew over here. We don't really need to dwell on it, just remember it. Uh, and we're trying to chop it up into little bits of polar rectangles. So what is a polar rectangle? It doesn't really look like a rectangle. What it involves is taking a tiny little smidgen of area, d, of arc rather, with of the yeah. And what we're going to do is take r and then r plus dr. So this is the outer radius r plus dr. And we're going to take a constant function value on that region. It's not quite a rectangle at all. It's got two little bendy bits. But actually, when this gets really thin, it becomes quite close to a rectangle. Also, when dr becomes quite small. The smaller it is, it's, it's really quite close to a rectangle. In fact, it's close to a rectangle where this length here is r d theta, 
right? You remember the circumference of a circle is pi r, 2 pi r, rather. <laughs> so if you only have an angle theta, then it will be theta times r. So look, here's the j. Let, let me call it phi. So phi r, this length is phi times r, which I'll write as r phi. And just as a reality check, if phi is 2 pi, you get the whole circle, 2 pi r. So basically, what I'm asking you to think of this is that this length here is r times the angle d theta. So it's like a little rectangle of length r d theta and dr. So in the limit, it's not a really huge stretch of the imagination to think of this as having area r d theta times dr, or as is normally written, r dr d theta. So just as the dA was like dx dy or dy dx, depending on which order of integration, I want you to think of dA as like r dr d theta in polar. And it was dx dy or dy dx in Cartesian, depending on which order you do the integral. Here we're always going to do the integral first in the r direction and then do the theta. That's just how we do it. So what I'm trying to tell you is this. If you have an integral like this, you can do it in polar coordinates as follows. First, the f part, you replace x by r cosine theta and the y by r sine theta. And the dA, you're not allowed to just write dr d theta. You have to put this extra r in there. What are you trying to calculate? You're trying to calculate a double integral. I'll give you some examples soon. Okay? I'm just trying to give you an alternative set of coordinates to calculate. It's like a change of variables, but a very specific one. Next week, we'll do Jacobians, which involves a more general... It's like a T substitution, except in, instead of X being changed, we're changing both X and Y to R and theta. Okay? So it's vital that you have this R in there. It's just You just need it. Now, the R integral, what, what are these points here? Well, we have to have certain functions. I'm going to call them G of theta and H of theta where I need to be a little bit more precise about the integral, the, the, in, the region that I'm integrating over. So I'm going to imagine that the region looks something like this. So it's clearly a polar -y sort of region. This curve is described in polar coordinates as r equals g of theta, and this curve is r equals h of theta. So what I want to do is pick a particular theta that's theta. And then I'm going to do this integral here. So this is, this is a, a length here of g of theta. And this is a length of h of theta. So I'm actually going to do, instead of chopping it up in vertically or horizontally, I'm actually going to chop it up like this. So I'm going to do each one of these integrals. Tick, 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 and all of the ones in between, and then integrate it. And you might get a feel of why you need this R. See, if you think about how these fan out, it's a lot more dense at the bottom than it is at the top. Right? There's more space at the top between these flanges than there is down the bottom. So if you just count them evenly, you're not really, you've got too much space here. You're counting these ones properly, but you're kind of not counting all this. So to make up for it, you have to count this more. You have to sort of fill in this extra little bit in a way. And that's why you need a greater integrand when r is bigger. Now, obviously, that's very ad hoc, but I'm just, it doesn't tell you why it's not r squared or r cubed or some other power of r like that um, or some other function. But nevertheless, it does give some intuition as to why you don't just have dr d theta. Well, you need to somehow have more stuff when R is bigger. 
Okay, so we understand this. Also, we need a theta limit, and that depends what this is. This is theta equals theta zero, say, up to whatever this n one is, which is theta equals theta one. So this is the technical Fabini theorem for polar coordinates. That's that's what that's the that's exactly what it is. Fabini's theorem for polar coordinates. Now we kind of need to do some examples to have a clue what I'm talking about here. So uh, here's an example. Yes. So the question is, yes, when is this especially useful? Indeed, if the function that you're, uh, if the region rather that you're integrating um, is sort of polar in nature, meaning yes, there are some arcs um, or, or rays or, you know, then you should think polar. Um, so here's an exact example of this that doesn't even mention the words polar coordinates. It just says, consider this double integral. Just find this double integral, zero to two, Integral from 0 to root 4 minus x squared, 1 over 1 plus x squared plus y squared dy dx. Now, actually, you could do that double integral, I believe, by just Fabini theorem in exactly what we've been doing before. But you'd be wasting a lot of time because it's much easier in polar coordinates. Let's see why. First of all, what is the region of integration? Actually, part A says sketch the region of integration. This says that x is going to go from 0 to 2. And from each value of x, y is going to go from 0 to four mi root 4 minus x squared. So we have to sketch this. y is root 4 minus x squared. Well, that's the top of a circle. y squared plus x squared equals 4. So it's a circle of radius 2. So this is the region of integration here. So I've actually reversed the process we've been doing from the other part, which is where I kind of had the region and I needed to write down the integral. Here I have the integral, I had to write down the region. I have to be able to do that. Well, this is a prime candidate for a polar coordinate thing, right? I mean, it's a circle sort of thing. Um, let's convert this to polar coordinates. So polar. First of all, r squared is x squared plus y squared. So I could substitute x equals r cosine theta and y is r sine theta, but it's good to know that x squared plus y squared is r squared. So the integral becomes 1 over r squared. The dy dx becomes r dr d theta. Don't forget the r. And now we just have to work out for a value. which ray you take, it always starts at 0 and goes up to 2. So the r is going from 0 to 2. And remember, this matches with the dr part. And what about the theta? Well, it's going from 0 to pi over 2. That's a much easier thing to handle, especially since the derivative of 1 plus r squared is 2r. So. The inner integral with respect to r, we're going to have a factor of a half. And it's just going to be log, well, absolute value. You don't need the absolute value because it's positive. Evaluated between 0 and 2, that d theta. And actually, nothing depends on theta. So we could even pull it out. But what the hell, we'll just finish it. Um, if you plug in 2, you get a half log 5. And if you plug in 0, you get half log 1, which is nothing. Well, this constant times 1, so this is just the length of that interval. So it's a half log 5 times pi over 2. Much easier to do it using polar coordinates. Everything's set up for you. The fact that the integrand is so nice in terms of r and theta and that the region is sort of so circular, round, squishy. No, not squishy, round. <laughs> All right. She likes my jokes. That was pretty silly, actually. I'll admit it. I'll admit it. All right. 
Here is a harder example that came from a previous final. Use polar coordinates, it said, to compute this integral. 0 to 2, 0 to root 1 minus x minus 1 all squared. Oh no, this is not from a previous final, this is from the textbook. But it's a harder example. So it specifically used polar coordinates to do this. All right. Again, in order to do this, we better set up what the thing looks like. Again, the dy integral is first. So x is from 0 to 2, but the function's a little bit different this time. It goes from 0 up to y equals root 1 minus x minus 1 all squared. If I manipulate that a little bit, I get x minus 1 all squared plus y squared equals 1, or at least the top half of that, because it's only the positive square root. So it's a circle center 1, 0 of radius 1. So this time, it looks like this. Sorry, the axis is not very horizontal. R the R the theta or R the theta the R Okay, so the, the question is if it's dx dy, are you going to change it? And the answer is that the dy dx part still becomes R d R d theta, but the region will look different. Because instead it will mean that x goes from this to whatever this is, which doesn't make any sense because this is it would have to involve a y. So the region would be different. The r d r d theta is the same regardless of whether it's dy dx or dx dy. Okay, in principle, this is just da no matter which order you write it in. But the convention is that this matches this, and this matches this. So it, it will affect these things here. That's how it matters. But no, d r d r d theta always. So, here is the tricky thing. We might be tempted to use polar coordinates around 1, but that doesn't really mean polar coordinates. That's, that's a transformation followed by polar coordinates. Instead, what we're going to have to do is work out for some angle theta, so that's theta here, r goes from 0 to what? What is that angle here? That's what we need to find out. We need to use some geometry. Sorry? This is not sine theta. This is, the, this is a circle. Sorry, it's not very clear. It's a semicircle because of this. This is the graph of, the, that's this graph actually. y equals root 1 minus x minus 1 all squared. OK? So this is the, this is the region that we're integrating over. Okay, so my question is, how do you find what that distance is? Uh, you could try to manipulate this, but and, and you would find it, but there's actually a really nice bit of geometry that you can do. You mentioned a right triangle. If you draw in this line here, the angle in a semicircle is a right angle, and this is 2. So cosine theta is r over 2. In other words, r equals 2 cosine theta. But you would have found this by doing your method. If you plug in r sine theta and r cosine theta and solve for r, you would find that. So the fact is that r starts at 0 and stops at 2 cosine theta. So you're going from 0 to 2 cosine theta. What's the lowest value of theta? 0. The highest value, you actually have to go all the way until your tangent here, which is actually all the way up to pi over 2. Even though that length's going to be pretty small at pi over 2, you can't really stop anywhere before, or else there'll be a little sliver of the circle that you'll miss, the semicircle that you miss. So you have to go from there to there. Okay, so that takes care of the limits of integration. 
unlike the previous problem where this was just from 0 to 2, this is now a variable limit of integration. So it happens. x is r cosine theta. y is r sine theta. And the denominator is just r squared. x squared plus y squared is r squared. And the dy dx is r dr d theta. And that is now the double integral in polar coordinates. So, so we don't have done the integral yet. We've just transformed it. OK, so you saw it was involved. We had to deal with the region of integration, which is by far the nastiest part. We had to change the, the integrand by using x and the formulas for x and y. And then dy dx is always r dr d theta. Now, luckily, the r's cancel out quite nicely. In fact, there's an r squared on the top and the bottom. So this works out as the integral from 0 to pi over 2 times oh, embedding the integral 2 cosine theta of just cosine theta plus sine theta, but it's, it's that dr d theta. So this is a constant. I'm sorry? Well, the top, there's a factor of r. And then there's an extra r here. So there's a factor of r squared. And that will cancel out the bottom. I mean, it's just lucky that that happened. But it's in a textbook, so things are often lucky. <laughs> Most integrals you just can't do, as you know. But this is a constant with respect to r. So you can sort of pull it out and just go the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of cosine theta plus sine theta times just this length, 0 to 2 cosine theta. Well, that's just 2 cosine theta. And now we have an integral we have to worry about. So to show you what you're up against, you have 2 cosine theta plus 2 sine theta cosine theta. Uh, thank you, yes. Um, OK, your question is, how do I do the r integral? Well, this is a constant, right? So I pulled it out, and I have the integral from 0 to 2 cosine theta dr, which is just 2 cosine theta minus 0. Okay. So yes, now that it's 2 cosine squared theta, we have to remember the formula. So you know, this is 104 stuff again. I told, you may have to do these sorts of integrals. You have to remember that cosine 2 theta, well, let's see. Let's just do it this way. Cosine squared theta is equal to 1 plus cosine 2 theta over 2. If it was sine squared theta, there'd be a minus there. OK, so 2 times this is just 1 plus cosine 2 theta. The other term I'll just leave for the moment. Actually, it's easiest. You could do it by substitution, but it's really easy to see that that's sine 2 theta. Remember the double angle formula for sine and cosine. So even though this is a one variable integral, it's got, you needed to know your techniques of integration. The integral of 1 is just theta. The integral of cosine 2 theta is sine 2 theta over 2. And the integral of sine 2 theta is minus cosine 2 theta over 2. And it's all this evaluated between 0 and pi over 2. And so if you do that, the theta gives you pi over 2. The sine bit goes away because you actually have sine of pi and sine of 0. The cosine bit, you've got to be a little more careful. Minus cosine pi. Um, cosine pi is minus 1, so you actually get a plus a half. And then cosine of 0, you get a minus minus a half. So you get another half. And this all works out to be, I believe, 1 plus pi over 2. All right, so polar coordinates. Just practice. You know, there are loads of examples on, say, polar coordinates. The, the homework might only have four or five, but it wouldn't hurt you to do, you know, another 15 or so. You'll find they get very quick as you go along. Any questions about anything I've said today in the last minute before we run out of time? All right, so next week we'll just continue as normal. Videos online. Thanks.